Okay, if you weren't able to tune into the recording from last night, um, we're doing something a little bit different this week. We, instead of doing a song of songs today, I'm going to do a part two of the Et Hanan, which is, and I pleaded, it's Moses pleading one last time to be able to enter into the promised land, to be able to see the land where Jerusalem is. And since we just had the fast of Tisha B'Av on Sunday, that's still fresh in your minds. Uh, maybe some of you fasted on that day, and, and maybe after we conclude the lesson, some of you next year will, will mark that on your calendar. Really need to fast on Tisha B'Av, um, because not only does it affect the history of the Jews, it affects the history of every Israelite, past, present, and future. Even COVID right now is on that cycle. Um, and for those of you that weren't around a couple years ago when we started teaching on COVID and the fast of Tibet and so forth, it's worthwhile going back and looking at those, those older recordings on YouTube to kind of give you a, a GPS, because I, I think we've, we've entered into that 30 month cycle, which means there's at least one more year where COVID's gonna be an issue. Uh, had it kind of ratcheted down, there was something that gave us a signal it would ratchet down on Sunday, didn't get any signals. Instead, we got the opposite. We've just got more variants. We've got more people being infected. So I suspect we're looking at another 12 months before there's some sort of breakthrough on this that would, in essence, reverse the siege of Jerusalem, which is the focal point. At any rate, we don't wanna do that. We wanna pick up with part two from last night and let's see, Cheryl, can you watch the hot mics for me? Okay. I'm gonna share. Close. All right, so we're doing Ba'echanan and kind of blending it with Tisha B'Av, uh, where we feel the longing for the, the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the longing for the rebuilding of the temple. And, you know, especially as believers in Messiah Yeshua, we see ourselves as a, a piece of the temple that has basically been thrown out among the nations. Um, the, the stones have been thrown down. They've been thrown out to the nations. And so we've had to become little miniature temples wherever we are, uh, a little sanctuary. And um, nevertheless, in exile, the, the divine presence is not as powerful as it is when we are united, when we are one body, when we are knit together. And so we are praying, we are longing for that return to Jerusalem, that return um, even to the building of the temple, understanding that even in the Jewish literature, the people were seen as the temple. The temple always reflected the state of the people, and the people reflected the state of the temple. They were not two disconnected things. Uh, so one way that was presented was it was better to destroy the building of the temple than to destroy the people. And so instead of literally destroying them, they were simply exiled. Uh, but when they are reunited, when the temple is kind of, I look at it like Legos, when we all come back together and we come one, become one united body, like the souls under the altar are crying out for, only then will we even begin to understand the power of his divine presence in Jerusalem. Right now, most people, uh, if they go into the city of Jerusalem, and especially if they get near the Temple Mount, they know something is different there. And so even without a temple, even without the body of Messiah drawn back together, you can still sense the power uh, that once resided there, even if it's at this point, just kind of a residue, 
that's left. So let's advance to where we stopped last night. You know, and my question is, do I long for the rebuilding of Jerusalem the same way that the Holy One does? Am, am I in his image in that way, or am I lackadaisical with how I see the land of Israel, the city, the holy city of Jerusalem, and the assembling of the body of Messiah, especially in Jerusalem at the Moedim? We covered more ground last night than I thought we did. Okay, so here we are. We want to uh, go back to Revelation and, and just in brief, last night's discussion had to do with um, the different things that stars symbolize. Of course, we know the stars can symbolize the descendants of Abraham. There's also um, a concept of stars as angels or other created beings, not human beings. Um, human beings can be the stars, like descendants of Abraham, Israel, but there are also created beings that have been put in places of rulership over the 17 nations of the earth. And we went through those scriptures last night showing how the, the boundaries of the nations were set according to the 17 names of the sons of Israel. And each of those 17 nations has its own, we might call it a principality and power. And its job is to look after the welfare of that particular nation. Um, but the difference between those 17 nations and Israel was that the Holy One himself uh, took on personal oversight of Israel. And last night we looked at how the Holy One himself fought for Deborah. It says the stars fought in the heavens. Well, typically the stars in the heavens will not, these principalities and powers, they will not fight for Israel because that's not their assigned task. They, they have a nation um, that they do rule over, that they are to manage. Um, and so if it's, if it's not in their nation's interest to help Israel, of course they would not. They would be very single-minded about that. And in those cases, we saw in the book of Daniel that the, the angel Michael and then Gabriel had to, to kind of have an argument, have a battle with the prince of Persia in order to answer Daniel's prayer. And we, we looked at, you know, sometimes that's the problem with our prayers. The answer could be no, um, but sometimes the answer is there's principalities and powers and you need to keep praying. It's not that the first prayer didn't reach heaven. It's just that the response is taking a little longer because perhaps the prayer that you're praying is contrary to the interest of the principality and power under which you're living right now among the 70 nations. And so the Holy One does have a personal interest in that, that message reaching you or your message reaching him. That's, that's the beauty of Messiah Yeshua. He says, I'm going to be there with you. I'm not going to leave you like orphans. I'm not going to leave you at the mercy of those principalities and powers. But nevertheless, we know there can be an obstruction. And so we see Daniel in exile experiencing an obstruction to his prayers. So those stars are also um, created beings set over the 17 nations. And um, the problem, like with astrology and idolatry and so forth, is that human beings, instead of acknowledging that those things are out there, unseen, but nevertheless a force, um, they turned to those forces and began to worship them as gods or predictors of the future. And Israel is warned very specifically, don't do that. Um, those stars, those principalities were appointed to the nations, not for you. You're, you're under the personal observation and care. At least we know in the land um, when Israel is in obedience, they are under the personal protection of the Holy One. They don't they don't resort uh, to seeking after the stars through astrology and so forth. Not that it's right for anybody in the nations to do that either, uh, but 
we have to at least acknowledge that if we are in a nation of exile, there is an appointed power that rules and looks after that particular territory. So in Revelation 12, 1, with that little bit of background, it says a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head, a crown of 12 stars, right? My focus really is, of course, we know the sun and the moon were also created on the fourth day of creation. So they have to do with governing and rulership. So the woman Israel, she's clothed with the sun. She's clothed with a, a garment of governing, which is what we said last night. The plan A was for the 12 tribes of Israel to sit at the 12 gates of Jerusalem and judge the 70 nations. Those principalities and powers of the 70 nations were put in place when Israel went into exile. And when Israel came out of exile, had she gone into the land in obedience instead of with a golden calf and complaining and griping and lusting and giving an evil report of the land, et cetera, I don't know that there would have been any need for those 70 rulers over the nations to continue their work as it pertained to the 70 nations because it's the 12 tribes that were supposed to originally judge those 70 nations at the 12 gates. Um, and so Israel being in exile, of course, plan B is still in place. There are still principalities and powers in high places. And so it says on the woman Israel, she's wearing a garment. She's clothed with the sun. It's gonna be a signal of rulership because of the fourth day of creation and that theme that you learned in workbook one about uh, governing being the, the primary verb of day four of creation. Same thing with the moon, the moon rules the night. And so this is under her feet. Uh, again, she's showing that the moon is subject to her. That's an interesting idea because, you know, Moses was told, you know, this shall be the, the beginning of the months that you shall proclaim. In other words, the, the 12 tribes of Israel had some ownership. They had some partnership with the Holy One in setting the calendar so that they could keep the Moedim. And then on her head, a crown of 12 stars. And when we see 12 stars, we think of the 12 tribes that were originally supposed to judge the 70 nations. And so this great sign appearing in heaven demonstrates that if not already, that the 12 tribes of Israel are poised to take over the rulership of the earth under the, the kingship of Messiah. Um, so she has returned to her king. Israel has returned to her king. She's returned to her own dominion, the land of Israel and the holy city. And now, just like all those scriptures we looked at last night, where he says, you're going to be like the stars. You're going to be as the stars. And we saw that the dominion that Israel was supposed to have was the dominion that the stars had to take over when they went into exile. And so this suggests there's a restoration of Israel's dominion over the earth. And again, this is assuming everything under the authority of the Holy One himself, who gave authority to Yeshua. And he says, I in turn, uh, I believe it's in the message to Thyatira. He says, I in turn will give you that authority so that you can be restored to fulfill the mission that you were originally chosen to do. All this is contingent upon obedience uh, returning to the land, returning to the holy city in obedience. So Revelation 1.20 says, As for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven, this version says churches. I prefer to use assemblies because a church raises a connotation of First Baptist on Main Street. And we definitely know that John never went to First Baptist on Main Street or even Second Baptist. Uh, these are assemblies. And the only seven assemblies 
John would have been familiar with, obviously, are the seven Moedim and Shabbat, which occurs on the seventh day. And so Shabbat is symbolic, again, of the seven feasts. In fact, each of those seven feasts will have a high Sabbath of some description, at least one of them. So he says the seven stars are the seven angels of those seven assemblies of the Moedim. And here again, we can see scripture is equating stars with angels. In other words, there, there are created beings called angels, which means a messenger, and it's their job to oversee uh, the, the conduct of Israel at the Moedim. We might even equate these with the seven Ushpizin of Sukkot. You know, the visitors come the seven nights of Sukkot to inquire as to how well you have dwelled in the clouds of glory. There might be some uh, connection there. At any rate, he says the seven lampstands are the seven assemblies. So we have Israel assembling at the seven Moedim. And then he says, and they, there's these angels who supervise, who oversee um, your welfare. Um, during these assembly times. And remember the seven Moedim, out of the seven, the, the three bones of the seven Moedim are going to be Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Those are the three foot festivals. They're centered in the temple, right? Um, what do they do? They're reflecting something that's happening in the heavens. The temple is patterned upon a temple in the heavenlies. And when the temple on earth reflects the same purity of the master, uh, the original in heaven, at that point, then the two are ready to merge again. The, at that point, they will become like married. And so We've got the stars representing the heavens, the heavenly temple. But then we also have the Israel made up of human beings who were made of earth. Their bodies are made of earth. And so the earthly temple, of course, um, the altar itself, it always had to be filled with earth because tradition is that when Adam was formed, his physical body was formed from the earth of the temple mount, either from under the altar or where the holy places. Um, I, I, it might be one of those yes answers, but the physical temple represents the, the physical body and obedience reflecting this temple above. And human beings were created to be able to engage both the spirit above and the natural body below. Um, at this point, we've had only limited experience with the spiritual realms. We're more earthbound right now, but we can see a return as being recorded here in Revelation for us to look forward to, to anticipate, not to hope for it, don't hope for it, anticipate it. Because when you hope for something, it's pretty passive. When you anticipate something, you start behaving and preparing as if, yes, it's really going to happen. A hope is kind of in the category of a wish. You know, make a wish and blow out the candles. No. Anticipation says, I believe it. And therefore, in my anticipation, I start making the preparations. I start keeping the feast today. I start keeping the Shabbat today. What we find in Revelation is that the rulers of these heavenly bodies that rule over the nations, um, their, their powers are going to be limited in the time of the end. Um, the benefits that they try to impart to their dominions, whatever preservation that they're responsible for doing right now, when the tribulation comes, their ability to preserve their dominions will be contracted. 
Revelation 8, 12 says the fourth angel sounded and a third of the sun, a third of the moon and a third of the stars were struck so that a third of them would be darkened and the day would not shine for a third of it and the night in the same way. All right, so by contracting the ability of these principalities and powers um, to manage those kingdoms, it sounds like he says they're struck. The stars are struck. In some way, it's going to limit, at least like for the sun, it's going to be darkened. The moon, it's going to be darkened, each for a third of the day. So it's losing one third of its power. Um, same thing with the principalities and powers that rule over the nations. It sounds like a third of their strength to rule is going to be struck. So it'll be a third weaker than it was before. Matthew 24, 29, Yeshua talks about this, and I believe he's referencing Isaiah 13, 10. If he's not, it's awful close. He says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the skies and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. I think right here he's alluding to those principalities and powers that have been set over the nations. They're going to be weakened and the power of Israel is rising at that point. They are beginning to take on that authority of the sun. They're beginning to take on that authority of the moon. They are beginning to take on the, the witness that the stars are supposed to be. Daniel 12, 3 says, those who have insight will shine like the glow of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Okay, there's again that phrase we've been seeing over and over, like the stars, as the stars. What do we know about the stars? They have dominion. They have rulership over the nations. And he says, there will come a time when you do have the insight, when you have that walk in the covenant, when your walk with Yeshua and the Holy One uh, when you reach that goal, you, you've run the race, you're going to shine like the glow of heaven. Your witness is going to be radiant, especially if you have led many to righteousness. And how could you not lead many to righteousness? And you say, well, I don't remember leading anybody to righteousness. You have no idea the influence and the effect that you have had on people, even if on the outside, it doesn't look like there's a lot of results. If you have been living a life of righteousness, then you have been that preservative. Uh, even in the place of your exile, you have been exercising some of that power that you were created to have over the world. And so, the fact that you're in exile, you're fragmented, you're like a Lego out there. Maybe you get together with other Legos on Shabbat and the feasts, but for the most part, you're, you're kind of a fragment. And you say, what, what good is the fragment? It's a lot of good. He says, right now it might be hard to see your shine, but a day is going to come for that glow that you are. It's, it's going to be just like a star in the heavens. You're, you're going to be set apart. Right now, being set apart just feels like you're weird and different. But the day will come when you're being different because you walk in the covenant. The true nature of your light will be seen. And that's my question. Once there is a restoration of Israel, once she has been returned to the holy city, once she has been restored to her gates, remember the 12 tribes last night, judging from the 12 gates of Jerusalem? If the tribes were exiled to Egypt, and that's when these boundaries of the nations were set up with the principalities and powers, then it makes sense what Daniel is saying. Once they are restored to Jerusalem, 
once they are restored to the kingdom of Messiah Yeshua, reunited with all the strength and power that goes with a united kingdom. I don't know that those powers are going to be necessary, and it might explain why in, in Matthew, Yeshua says the powers of the heavens are going to be shaken. Um, they're not going to be needed anymore once Israel is restored. Talk about good news. Um, and then the night watches. Psalm 136.9 says, He made the moon and the stars to rule by night, for his faithfulness is everlasting. The moon and the stars to rule by night. Uh, there's a witness there. When you're witnessing to the feasts, when you're witnessing to the Shabbat, when you're witnessing to the Torah, when you're witnessing to the word, you are an example of his faithfulness to the world. That's why you were chosen. And so you can rule by night. You can rule in the darkest times because that is what Israel is. They were set, uh, they were chosen in this world and even the boundaries of the nations are set according to their names and their number. So in up to this point, we've, we've looked at several different um, points that came up in the Torah portion, and Moses ties them all together. He says, the reason I'm mentioning all this is you need to obey the Torah covenant in the land of Israel. And if we see that that's how the Holy One expresses his, his personal oversight uh, when he takes them to the land, when they establish Jerusalem, when they establish the feasts in the land of Israel, when they prepare the physical land to merge once again with the garden, uh, then we see why it's important to be obedient. Because if they're not obedient, um, in other words, if they don't keep the Ten Commandments, including adultery, idolatry, and the Shabbat, if they don't keep those commandments, then we have these principalities and powers that continue to rule the world. And it's, it's not as though they are usurping the power of the Holy One. I don't think that's the case at all, because the suggestion there is he set them in place to fill a vacuum of Israel in exile. So there's an interesting um, thought about the Shema. And Moses repeats the Shema in this Torah portion, Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohinu Adonai Echad. And if you'll notice, uh, I took a screenshot of the text, the Ayin in Shema and the Dalit in Echad, those are oversized letters. They're, they're bigger than the ones, other ones um, in the, the Shema. What does that do? It spells something. The Ayn and the Dalit together, they spell Ed or witness. What does an Israelite do when that Israelite recites the Shema or reads the Shema twice a day and says, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad? And, and you go into the full Shema. When you do that twice a day, you are witnessing basically to the entirety of the covenant. You're witnessing to his word. And in fact, Yeshua said, you are my witnesses. So he's identifying himself with that word to be carried out to the nations. You are my witnesses. You are my edim. So when you say Shema Yisrael, yes, you're identifying with a nation that ultimately will rule over the earth, but you're also witnessing to the testimony of Yeshua and the commandments of God. That's what the Shema is all about. You're saying, I'm a witness to that. And that's what Israel was supposed to be. They were supposed to be his witnesses, his faithful and true witnesses. And they were to witness to the truth, to the whole world. 
They were to be like the stars, bearing witness to Moses' word. Remember when he begins to sing the song of Moses, he calls heaven and earth to witness to his words. And so when we do the Shema, we do it twice daily. We do it in the morning, we do it in the evening. When we wake up, when we go to bed, regardless of where you are in the world, it doesn't matter if you're in Jerusalem or not, you proclaim that, that testimony twice daily. You're testifying to the commandments of Adonai twice daily. Now, let's go back to this passage in Revelation that we've looked at before about the souls under the altar. Remember, they're not just any souls under the altar. The text specifically says that, that they've been slain for the word. They have been slain. They've been pursued in their lives, and they have been killed for their observance of the commandments of God and their testimony of Yeshua, which are one and the same. So it's not just any people. It's people who have suffered for the sake of their testimony. So let's go back to this aid, Ayn Dalit. Uh, witness is aid, plural would be edim. Uh, the Ayn, it has a numerical value of 70. The Dalit has a numerical value of four. Now think of what you learned in workbook one of the creation gospel about day four. Even if you did workbook two, what you learned about the Dalit seal, the fourth seal, it's all about authority. What does John see in Revelation? He sees a door standing open. It represents authority, passing the authority from heaven to earth. And Yeshua is going to be that vehicle by which the authority of heaven is transferred completely to the earth. So on the fourth day of creation, the stars were created along with the sun and the moon. It says for the sake of the Moedim, for the sake of the feast. Before there was a human being, the feast days were proclaimed on the fourth day of creation. So those stars were witnessing to the feast days. The stars were like a prophecy of the human beings to come on the sixth day. And the human beings were created to also witness to his Moedim. So when we see a witness, aid, a witness is supposed to witness to the nations, the 70 nations. And they are supposed to witness to the authority of the Holy One, the authority of Yeshua who is standing at the Delet, the door, the Dalet. Again, that value of four, meaning authority, governing. To the nations, those who say Shema Yisrael should be saying that Yeshua is that living word and he has the authority of the Father. And he is going to reestablish the Father's kingdom on earth. And it's starting with me as a witness to it. I'm telling you, before it gets here, it's coming and in fact is already here because Israel is here, even though they're scattered like Legos. And the spirit is in Israel. And you have no idea what the spirit is going to be like when Israel is gathered together. Revelation 6, 9 through 10, we'll just read that. It says, and, and I put in bold the lamb. I want you to think of why they would use the lamb in this particular part of the vision. It says, when the lamb broke, the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been killed because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who live on the earth? Right? We just came out of the, the example of how this demonstrates the the bloodshed and the manslayer and the cities of refuge. But now, this is something that uh, I found. I want to say this is in Rabbi Kook's commentary on the Echanan. 
and he's talking about martyrdom. And their view of martyrdom is very similar to ours because we would always read these words from Revelation. The, the people had been killed because of the word of God and because of the testimony. We take it as a given that that testimony is Yeshua. But if we also take it as a given that the, the testimony of Yeshua is that he is the word of God, then we understand that it's people who have suffered for the sake of that word. So he says that uh, Psalm 44, 23, and the Psalm says, for your sake, are we killed every day? We are reckoned as sheep for the slaughter. In other words, the psalmist is saying, an Israelite dies every day. A righteous person dies every day. A martyr for the word will die every day. He says that applies to Israel in a specific context. He says, by reading the Shema daily with the readiness to relinquish life for Hashem, we are considered as having suffered martyrdom for his sake. Now, when I was much younger, I read that and thought, well, these were just people like the martyrs, the early Christians that got eaten up by lions in the Colosseum or something. But according to the traditional viewpoint, it's a connection to the Shema. You, you would have to be very explicit with that for somebody who didn't know the tradition. But if you were to ask somebody who understood this viewpoint of why we say the Shema twice a day, because when you say it, you're not just saying it. When you say the Shema, you consciously accept that today I am going to relinquish my life to the Holy One. You may not be martyred that day, but in that sense, you were killed every day. You accept that upon yourself, that if it, it requires my life for me to obey the word today, that's why I'm saying this. You shouldn't be saying it for any other reason. If you were not 100% committed to the Holy One and his kingdom and obedience to him, there's no reason to say the Shema. But if you say it with that true intent, if it costs me my life, if I have to put my money where my mouth is on this Shema, then I'm going to get killed every single day. I'm going to suffer martyrdom every day, twice a day. So if you are in the habit of saying the Shema twice a day, then you are, are one of the uh, brothers and sisters to those souls under the altar who were crying out, how long? And then he tells them to rest for a little while because there's more being added. There's more people saying the Shema every day. There are more people losing their lives as sheep for the slaughter every day because of the word of their testimony, which is just pretty cool. There's so many things, there's so many commandments that we obey. And we just have no idea of the impact they're having in the heavenlies on the Father. Because even though we are killed every day like sheep for slaughter, we have the hope of Yeshua and the anticipation of his return. We have that, that expectation of his return, so much so that it changes our lives every day and how we choose to live those lives every day. It's fine if you slaughter me every day on account of my testimony for Yeshua and the commandments of God. Because of Yeshua, I know I can be resurrected. Whether it's a, whether it's a killing just of my feelings, my intellect, um, my desires, maybe I got hungry on Tisha B'Av, maybe I get hungry on Yom Kippur, but I know there's a resurrection of my soul. If somebody were to literally put me to death for my faith in Messiah Yeshua and for my 
belief in the covenant, then he can resurrect me from that too. There is nothing from which he cannot resurrect me. So now I want to go back to the iron we talked about just briefly last night. Um, and it has to do with the stones of the altar, not just in their travels in the wilderness, but also as they built the temple. If you'll remember when King Solomon built the temple, they didn't bring the stones to the temple mount and then hew them out. They actually shaped the stones uh, in the quarries so that when they, they brought the stones into the temple area, it maintained a very reverent silence. You, you wouldn't hear the sound of iron tools in the temple area. Uh, Deuteronomy 27, five says, moreover, you shall build there an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall not wield an iron tool on them. And in fact, remember they had to be filled with earth. Again, if Adam was created from the earth of the Temple Mount, then it makes sense why the altar would be filled with earth. It would represent the, the human being sacrifice, being one of those martyrs under the altar, if that makes sense, better sense now. Uh, Rabbi Cook also commented, he said, the fundamental aim of the temple is the exact opposite of iron. Iron is a symbol of death and destruction. Implements of war and slaughter are fashioned from metal and iron. Iron is a material used to shorten life. The temple, however, is meant to lengthen life. Its very presence, even in the sacrifices, it preserved life. He went on and he said the purpose of the temple is universal peace and enlightenment. And he quotes what Yeshua quoted. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. So the incompatibility between iron and the temple was so great, they couldn't use the, the, the tools to hew the stones while they built the temple. And when the temple was destroyed, remember that's what we we commemorate on Tisha B'Av the destruction of the two temples and the desecration um, after the defeat at Betar that we talked about last week. But the Talmud teaches that when the temple was destroyed, the gates of prayer were locked and a wall of iron separates us from our heavenly father. Now, don't take that too literally. They're making a point here. Rome is represented by iron. If you'll remember the, the image of the beast that King Nebuchadnezzar saw, each kingdom was separated into a certain type of metal. There was gold, there was silver, there was bronze, and then of course there was iron legs, and then the iron was mixed with the clay feet. And so Rome was the kingdom of iron. Rome was the one that, that destroyed the last temple. And then they sent the Jews into exile. And so the prayers of the temple at that point, there was like an iron gate that shut on the prayers that took place in the temple at that time, the sacrifices that took place in the temple at that time, the incense service, the lighting of the menorah, all of these things that ascended to heaven on behalf of the nations. Remember, it was a house of prayer for all nations. And even at Sukkot, they offer 70 bulls on behalf of the 70 nations. The iron door shut on that. And it says the destruction of the temple was like an iron gate swinging shut. And so the rule of the temple, what influence Israel could have still had when the temple stood as it pertained to the 70 nations of the world. Those 70 nations of the world were left entirely in the hands of the principalities and powers. And we know that if those 70 nations are quarreling, 
And if the job of an angel is simply to benefit his own territory, then it makes sense that those powers would also be at odds with one another. Remember, it's, it's the Holy One himself who can synthesize and who can harmonize many different missions at one time in a state of peace. Created beings typically aren't able to multitask like that. Remember a lesson about Yeshua in the boat? And it said, let he who is God come and finish the north wind. Let him take control of these winds and manage them to bring peace instead of working against one another and bringing destruction. And they say the temple really was the, that last defense um, to prevent the nations from just descending into repeated wars. Um, and we can see that in history. There's been very little, in fact, uh, there were significant events that kicked off World War I and World War II um, that pertain to the Ninth of Av that do seem to be specifically related to this iron gate swinging shut, um, the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, the expulsion of the Jews from England. There's, there is a whole history on the ninth of Av of this iron gate swinging shut on prayers. The good news is, remember, the gates of repentance are always open. That gate never swings shut. But now, with the destruction of the temple, apparently it's much more difficult for certain prayers to be answered because of the competing interests of these principalities and powers. The great news for us is we have an advocate in Messiah Yeshua. And if we pray in his name, then I, I think you're, uh, you've got an advantage when you're fighting against those principalities and powers in high places. Sometimes we don't understand why people act the way they act. Well, you have to know who they're worshiping, who their ruler is. And if they've placed um, improper, if they've attributed in power improperly to something other than the Holy One, then they're going to act according to the interests. And it, it might be something from within themselves. And it might be an exterior influence that we don't know about. But the that rule of iron, again, it's represented by Rome, which had the iron legs of the beast. And the difference between Babylon, because Babylon also pops up again in the book of Revelation, as well as Rome. You say, well, where's Rome in the book of Revelation? When you see a scarlet beast, or a, yeah, when you see the beast, uh, especially the, the one with, I think it had like iron teeth or something, um, you're seeing Rome's influence. It, you just have to understand the symbolic language, really, of Jewish literature. But the golden head of Babylon, remember, Isaiah 14, 13 addresses the king of Babylon, and he says, you wanted to rule over heaven. You wanted to ascend above the stars. But Rome's ambition, that was the golden head of Babylon, that head wanting to stick up into the heavens. But Rome's ambition was always to rule the earth. And we get that with the iron and clay feet. There's um, a psalm where the Babylonians taunt the Jews once they've destroyed their temple and they've taken them into exile to Babylon, they start taunting the Jews. It says, you know, we sat by the rivers of Babylon and the Babylonians taunted us and they said, sing us songs of Zion. And they said, how can we sing a song of Zion after the temple's been destroyed? Because even though they were overcome with idolatry and bloodshed and sexual immorality, nevertheless, there was a remnant who understood the magnitude of the loss of the temple to the world. And how does this pop up again in Revelation 18? Well, that whole chapter, as we read it, it's in the context of Babylon, except it's, it's flipped. 
whereas the Babylonians are taunting the Jews who are crying by the rivers of Babylon for the loss of the temple, it's flipped in Revelation 18. And now it's Babylon, i.e. the merchants of the earth, who are crying because that economic system has been brought down. Kind of a beautiful turnabout. Um, but we see Yeshua is going, going to also recompense Rome. There's not just going to be vengeance upon the golden head of Babylon. It's going to go all the way to the iron feet. Because he says very specifically, he's going to rule the nations with iron. Iron is for the nations, not the temple. Iron is for the nations, not for Israel. Revelation 2.27 says he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter are shattered, as I also have received authority from my father. Do you see the two substances right there that describe the rule of uh, Rome's final days? The daughters of Rome, remember the iron legs are Rome, and then it goes, it just descends and stops with the iron and clay feet of Rome. And so Yeshua will rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are shattered. You get the iron and you get the clay. So Rome also will be smashed. And it, in turn, where is it ruled with a rod of iron over Israel? It will now be ruled with a rod of iron. Revelation 19.15 says, from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. So we can see again the rod of iron, the last vestiges of Roman rule are going to be overturned. And here's the psalm, Psalm 137. It's a beautiful psalm, hard to, to read it without crying. It's um, by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down and wept when we remembered Sion. Upon the willows in the midst of it, we hung our harps. For there our captors demanded of us songs and our tormentors jubilation saying, sing for us one of the songs of Sion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, if I forget you, may my right hand forget his skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy, remember, Lord, against the sons of Edom, that's Rome, the day of Jerusalem, those who said, lay it bare, lay it bare to its foundation. Daughter of Babylon, you devastated one, blessed will be the one who repays you with the retribution with which you have repaid us. Blessed will be the one who seizes and dashes your children against the rock. So even though Rome was not even a thing yet in Psalm 137, as this Psalm is written to the daughter of Babylon, it also says, remember Lord against the sons of Edom, the sons of Rome, from the golden head of the image of the beast all the way to the iron and clay feet of Rome there will be retribution. Our job is to never forget Jerusalem. And so there again, um, Revelation just kind of sums up everything that we've already been told about the destroyers of the first and the second temples. So when we fast on Tisha B'Av, when we mourn the destruction of the first and second temples, 
even when we look at Psalm 137, it reminds us of those two destroyers, Babylon and Rome. So let's get back to these night watches. He says, he made the, the moon and the stars to rule by night. And that's my question. We've talked about witnesses, tank, saying the Shema twice a day. Saying the Shema twice a day, remember, says, I would die for this testimony. I'm this serious. Well, do we also mourn for the destruction of the temple like the Holy One? Do we have the same view of the destruction of the temple as the Holy One? You say, well, I don't really know that I, you know, I know what the ninth of Av is, or um, I don't see the point in fasting on the ninth of Av. That's kind of a Jewish thing. But let's rethink that. Fasting on the ninth of Av is a very express statement that says we are mourning, like Psalm 137, if I ever forget Jerusalem. May my right hand, if I'm right-handed, forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth where I can never utter another word of the Shema, because I don't deserve to say it. The question is, do we witness with him? We say, well, I'm a witness. Do we witness with him concerning his holy habitation? His desire to return to Jerusalem. His desire to gather his body there. So Jeremiah 25, 30 says, Therefore, you shall prophesy against them all these words, and you shall say to them, the Lord will roar from on high and raise his voice from his holy dwelling. He will roar forcefully against his fold. He will shout like those who tread grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. A clamor has come to the end of the earth because the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He is entering into judgment with humanity. He's roaring from his holy habitation, from his holy dwelling. He's shouting. He's clamoring all the way to the ends of the earth. He's roaring over his temple. He's roaring over his habitation on earth. Because those who were chosen to be that temple and maintain it in obedience and to bring the earth to a state of peace and prayer, they destroy that temple with every sin. Are we roaring over the loss of the temple? Are we roaring about the fact that we're Legos scattered among the 70 nations of the world? Are we clamoring the way that he is to return? Tradition records three watches of the night when you can hear the lion roar. Remember the moon was appointed to rule by night and the stars also witness. They witness along with the moon. And it, without the moon, how do you even know when to observe the Moedim. Without the witness, these feasts which you shall proclaim. Well, there's three watches of the night when they say you can hear the lion roar. And if you're on watch, if an Israelite is truly on watch in these night seasons, they might be able to process the roar of the lion concerning Jerusalem. It says the night consists of three watches, and during each watch, the Holy One sits and roars like a lion. The sign for this, in the first watch, a donkey brays, and the second, dogs howl, and in the third, 
If a baby nurses from its mother and a woman converses with her husband. Now you can tell that that is highly symbolic language. So he explains it. These are metaphors because each of those three watches represents the spiritual decline of Israel. Once its temple was destroyed and the nation exiled, um, that spiritual decline set in. And we think, well, didn't they decline spiritually in order for the temple to be destroyed? Yes, but without the temple, it was worse. And so he explains each of these watches, and it corresponds to a service of Adonai, that it that becomes a challenge when we're in exile, when there's nothing to gather us to one central location, to his holy habitation. The first, the donkey bring, its deeds and actions. It says, due to the exile, these are tainted by the nations and specifically Babylon's overall atmosphere of self-centeredness and materialism. So again, if you were Jewish and you were reading the book of Revelation and you see chapter 18 devoted to Babylon and why the merchants of the earth are grieving, well, they would understand that the judgment has fallen on those who have declined spiritually in their deeds and their actions due to the, the pressure of Babylon. And that's our fight. We're told to come out of her. We're supposed to come out of self-centeredness. We're supposed to come out of materialism, which it goes back to, are you not hoping for the kingdom, but you're actually anticipating the kingdom? Because when you anticipate the kingdom, you spend your days differently. There's less self-centeredness. There's less materialism. Instead, you take those materials he supplies you and you use it to further his kingdom. You learn every day how to love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, the linguistic connection there is the braying of the donkey, which is a chamor, is indicating materialistic tendencies, chumriut. So when you think of the first watch of the night, you want to guard your heart. If you hear the lion roar in the watch of the night, you will examine yourself for self-centeredness and materialism. The second roar um, is going to be represented by the howl of the dog. Uh, one of the, the traits of the dog they pointed out is that a dog is known for insolence. And you say, well, oh, not my dog. But it's true. Most dogs, if they don't know someone and take it from a bicycle rider, it, there's way more danger from dogs chasing us <laughs> than from getting hit by a car. Because it's instinctual to a dog to present an aggressive front to a stranger, somebody passing through his property. They're, they're not all born hospitable. And so they say the second watch of the night is for acquiring positive character traits. And those are described in the New Testament as the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, goodness, meekness, faith, those things. Um, and they say without the temple, the people after whom the nations could model themselves with kindness and compassion, those numbers are reduced, they're scattered, and in scattering, there's a reduction of power. Um, even while the temple stood, this was reduced because they were ruled by the iron rod of Rome. Rome was actually supervising in the, the last uh, days of the temple, the last decades of the temple for sure. In fact, even before the time of Yeshua, the temple was under the thumb of Rome. And so kindness and compassion were reduced. 
And this is the howl of the dog. Um, the dog can also symbolize greed. Uh, they have incredible appetites, brazenness. They'll just go out and bark at you. <laughs> They're not always that respectful until they are trained. And a lack of sovereignty. Um, and that's, they're, they're taking that from Isaiah 56, verses 10 through 11. And then the, the third watch of the night is serving God with all the mind as the Shema enjoins. Because remember, the Shema is about teaching. It's a teaching proclamation of faith. And in this watch of the night, when the lion roars, he doesn't want you to let your Torah learning be diminished or debased. Um, one of the sayings in the Talmud is that words of Torah cannot contract ritual impurity. If you want purity in your life, then learn the words of the Torah. Live the words of the Torah. These are positive signs. The, the two signs there of the baby nursing and the wife conversing with her husband, these are signs of divine intimacy and provision. When the lion roars in the third watch, he's, he's looking for intimacy with his betrothed. He's looking to nurse the babies. But each of these, they say, indicates a, an arrested development in the exile because we're not realizing our full potential there. Of course, a nursing baby, um, they need to grow. And they say even this metaphor here of a, a wife speaking with her husband, the, the Hebrew word there is misaparet. And misaparet is telling stories, um, kind of being entertained. Nothing too deep right here. It doesn't have the deeper content. It describes a people who are afraid of deep study. They would instead rather have an inspirational story. But this growth is still, it's, there's a positive sign here. And so that growth can be restored again with the restoration of the temple. See, when Israel rules the earth in the kingdom of Messiah, then the many distractions of Babylon, the many distractions of Rome, and every other thing, every other donkey braying, every other dog barking to distract us, those distractions can be removed when Israel judges the earth. And therefore, growth can be restored. All the things that are inhibiting growth right now, that growth can begin to take place. And so they make the point that if you recognize the night watches, then you'll busy yourself trying to overcome those deficits of the exile from Jerusalem and being removed from the place of the temple. And again, with that sense of anticipation, you know that it's only going to be as a reunited body of Messiah that Israel can fulfill its mission to the nations. That's why Yeshua sent out his disciples. Go into all the nations, tell them the good news, encourage them because there's going to be lots of long night watches until he returns. And those souls are the, under the altar saying, how long, O oh Lord, are we going to have to wait for our brothers and sisters to be added to this body? How long until all over the earth we begin to hear the Shema? along with the intent of the heart that goes with the Shema that says, he is my God. There is none other. There is no one beside him. And I would give my very life for what I'm saying. I truly believe it. I am a witness. So it's, it's time to rise. If you have the testimony of Yeshua, if you have the testimony of the lion of the tribe of Judah, if you have the commandments of Adonai, it's time to roar. The Holy One is roaring in the night watches because he longs for his holy habitation to be rebuilt. 
He longs for us to enter through the gates of repentance. It's time for us to proclaim these fasts in the restoration of Jerusalem. It's time for the body of Messiah to start longing to visit Jerusalem instead of Disneyland. If not, if we don't have that same longing that the lion has, if we are not roaring over Jerusalem in the holy habitation the same way that the holy one is, then COVID and sword and famine and death will roar all over the earth. And so how many believers do fast for the temple? Zechariah 8, 19 says, the Lord of armies says this, the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth months will become joy, jubilation, and cheerful festivals for the house of Judah. So love, truth, and peace. You fast for those festivals because you love truth and peace. You fast for those festivals. See, right now they're not festivals. They're fasts, but they will be festivals. You're, you're celebrating a festival before it's a festival. You're separate. You're, you're celebrating it as a day of mourning because you believe, you anticipate that the temple will be restored. And that instead of a temple being destroyed on Tisha B'Av, it will be restored on Tisha B'Av. Instead of there being breaches in the walls, there's going to be walls that are repaired. Instead of an end of the monarchy in the fast of the seventh month, you are going to see the beginning of a monarchy with the house of David. That's what we see in these fasts. We proclaim our longing, our roaring, for that restoration, for King Messiah to return, set up his kingdom, restore the gates of Jerusalem so that peace can come again to the earth. Plan A can return to the earth. And so, folks, if we are the stars, if we are like the stars, if we have the dominion like the stars, if we have the power of the Holy One in us, if the same spirit that resurrected Yeshua from the dead dwells in us, then we should be roaring like he is roaring. From his holy habitation, roaring to be reunited with the holy place on earth. Longing for his people to be reunited. It's time to start making some noise.